Thank you, musicians, for that. Take your Bibles and go to the book of Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I'm going to give you a heads up. I've got a lot of message on paper tonight, so I probably won't. I've already halfway decided that I'm not going to get to all of it, and we'll have to break it up. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I just don't think that it's going to be possible to get through it. So let's, uh, without any further ado, let's get right into it. Acts chapter 9. And uh, we're going to read the first 18 verses, if you're able and willing to join me in standing. I ask you to do that in honor of the reading of God's word. Acts chapter 9, verse number 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he, would, uh, uh, if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do too? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, but uh, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. We met a man by the name of Ananias several chapters back, I think it was chapter 5. A different one, of course, that Ananias uh, died in chapter 5. And so this is not that same Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he removed sight for I am sorry, he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Verse five will be our main focus uh, this evening. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Uh, tonight is Act sixteen. The title of the message is this, The Question. The Question. What is the question? Who art thou, Lord? We see that in verse number 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And so we want to talk about that, the question, this evening. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your, uh, uh, your word. I'm so thankful that we can learn from it. I'm so thankful that we can have it in our hands and we can uh, uh, learn about you. We'll see tonight that in your word we know about you. You reveal yourself to us. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that we can see you in our word. We can get to know you through your word. Oh, help us, God, I pray, draw closer to you. Help us draw nigh, draw near to you. Lord, we pray through the preaching of God's word. I pray you'd fill me with your spirit. I'm not worthy of any uh, any power, strength, ability that you might give me. But oh, how I need it. Lord, I pray you'd fill me with your spirit. That you'd use me to speak to your people. That your people would be filled with your spirit as well. We ask it in Jesus' name. For his sake we pray. Uh, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Over the past several weeks, we preached on Act 10, the multiplication. When the people of the church multiplied, 
so did the problems of the church. And the answer was to choose out seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who they appointed over the business of the church. They didn't go somewhere else and uh, bring their problems with them. No, they said, hey, we have a problem here as we've multiplied. And as you multiply people, you multiply problems. And what they did is they said, all right, let's sit down and figure out what to do. Let's ask the Lord for direction. And, and God guided them. And they chose out seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom they appointed over the business to, to rectify the issue, the problems that they had in the church. And then we see Act 11, the defamation. Stephen, one of the seven chosen, preached in the temple. And after he preached in the temple, they hired false witnesses to accuse him. They defamed him, the defamation. Act 12, the execution. Stephen's message to the high priest and the council uh, 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 was uh, recorded there in Acts chapter uh, 7. And uh, then we see his subsequent murder. Act, thir Act uh, 13, the persecution. Saul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, of whom we read in tonight's passage, began to persecute the church, and the believers began to spread out from Jerusalem. So we see this persecution in Jerusalem right after. Remember, Saul is the one who they lay their coats at, at his feet uh, during the, the, the murder, the, the stoning uh, of Stephen. And he begins to persecute, and they begin to spread out from there. And uh, then we see uh, Act 14, the magician. The, the result of that spreading out, Philip, one of the seven, uh, mentioned in Acts chapter 6, went down to Samaria and began to preach to the people there. Uh, while he was there, he witnessed to a man by the name of Simon, a sorcerer, and we called him the magician. So that was Act 14, the magician. And then last time, that was two weeks ago, uh, the conversion. After Philip witnessed to, uh, in Samaria, he went to Gaza to participate in the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And I have it worded that way on purpose, to participate in the conversion. Aren't you glad that we're not the ones that convert people, but we're allowed to participate in the conversion? I've, you know, you've heard people say, a, a new Christian say, well, he saved me. Someone saved me. Talking about a, a, a witness, a soul winner, someone that gave him the gospel. And we understand that what they mean, but that's not the, the case at all. If someone witnesses to me, that person doesn't save me. I have no ability to save anyone all, at all. But I'm so grateful, so thankful that I'm allowed, I'm given the opportunity to participate in the conversion. And we see that and have a role in it, although we're not the ones that are, are saving. And we see Philip uh, uh, participating in the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And so tonight we arrive in Acts chapter 9. Acts 9 is the beginning of a very slow transition in focus that will take place over the next several chapters. And that's an important thing I, uh, uh, to understand in the, in the grand scheme of things. And remember how we're talking about the book of Acts. And we're breaking it up by act and, and act one, act two, act three. And tonight is act 16. And it's the question we're talking about. But before I get into the message, the meat of the message that, that will we'll, we'll, uh, show the principles, the truths in this message, and then uh, the application. Before we get into that, what I'd like to do is kind of, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? But uh, scale out, uh, uh, zoom out, that's the word I'm looking for. Zoom out and look at the book of Acts as a whole for a little bit. And we've been talking about the apostles, the 12 apostles specifically. Now, there are more than 12 apostles in the sense of those that uh, uh, spent time with Jesus. An apostle is one that spent time with Jesus and, and was sent to preach out. In the book of Revelations, uh, the book of Revelation, we see the name of 12 apostles that are written down. And so we know there's those 12, but then we also see, like, uh, uh, who is the, the 12th apostle? Well, who's the 13th apostle? You know, Judas was technically an apostle. Uh, who's the 13th apostle? Was it uh, uh, Matthias? Was it Paul? We're going to see that the Apostle Paul was, a, uh, was an apostle. We'll also see another man who I think is probably uh, um, the most, uh, how do you say it this way, the most underrated uh, a personality in the book of Acts, a man by the name of Barnabas. Oh, he has such an important role in the, bar, in the book of, of you know, and, and we'll get to it. We've already mentioned Barnabas. In chapter uh, 4, remember when they started taking and selling their lands? We talked about Ananias a moment, again, a moment ago, Ananias and Sapphira. Do you know who the first person uh, to do that 
that was Barnabas. Barnabas was the first one to say, all right, I'm going to sell my land and I'm gonna, we're, we're, we're going to give it uh, for, for others. And so Barnabas was the beginning of that. Barnabas is referred to as an apostle. apostle. And so uh, Barnabas was clearly with the, them uh, at the beginning of Acts uh, because he was the one, the first one to sell his property. So uh, when I say apostle, I'm going to use it loosely as uh, described or defined as someone who has been with Jesus, uh, uh, who has seen Jesus, who was uh, one of his uh, uh, disciples. We know there are more than 12 disciples. He sent out more than 12. Uh, um, but there was 12 specific disciples, 12 apostles, and those that went out, uh, we'll call them as apostles. And so uh, at the beginning, you see basically, at the beginning of the book of Acts, you see uh, uh, basically uh, Peter and the 12 apostles in Jerusalem. And so let me help you. And as, when I talk about the uh, transition, I mentioned uh, uh, Acts 9 is the beginning of a very slow transition. We're zooming out, looking at the whole book of Acts for a moment. It's the beginning of a very slow transition in focus that will take place over the next several chapters. This transition is not an abrupt or total change, uh, um, but a gradual shift of focus over the next several chapters. The mental image that I would like to convey is not like moving a camera from one view to a completely different view, but a gradual change in focus from something in the same view. It's a gradual transition uh, from an object in the foreground to an object in the background. The kind of transition of focus that never really loses view of the object in the foreground, but certainly is not as clear as the object in the background. You say, what are you talking about? I feel like... Uh, Some of y'all are looking at me like uh, you're ranting and raving about nothing. Let me try to help you understand what I'm saying. Typically, when we think about a change in focus, we think about, for instance, where the piano and the organ are. Well, we're going to focus here, and then now we're going to shift our focus, and we're going to focus here. And what I'm saying is in the book of Acts, it's not as much as a change in views as as much as there's something in the foreground that is being focused upon, and will have a slow, gradual transition of focus from something that is in the foreground to something that is in the background. And the main focus will be what's on the, in the background. Uh, neither were ever completely out of the view. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I'm going to explain this in a moment. Neither are ever completely out of the view, but at one point, one is more in view, or more in focus, rather, and then we're going to shift, and, and chapter 9 is the beginning of a gradual shift in focus from what is in the foreground to what is in the background. The transition is over the next few chapters, and the focus slowly shifts in three ways. First of all, in regard to the people, there is a slow transition in focus from the Jews to the Gentiles. Over the next several chapters, we'll see uh, tonight, uh, uh, God calls a man who, when he says, speaks to Ananias, look what it says in verse number um, 15. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he has chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. And so we begin to see a, a slow shift in focus. Are you saying, Pastor, that we're taking our eyes off the Jews and going to the Gentiles? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we begin to shift Focus. One is in the foreground, one is in the background, and we begin to see that it's never out of the picture, never out of the view, but we see a shift in focus. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then, not just in the people, but in the place or places. We begin in the book of Acts to see a slow transition in focus over the next several chapters from Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. We begin to uh, 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 not just see the, the, the transition from Jews to Gentiles in regard to focus, but as you turn your pages from, from uh, uh, Acts 1 to Acts 9, everything has happened in Jerusalem, Judea, almost all in Jerusalem, but then some in Judea and Samaria. The furthest away so far we've gotten is uh, Samaria, and then last chapter we talked about in, was in Gaza, which is still in the Judea area. And so we're, we're right there in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. But before we get to the end here, again, I'm not saying that we just completely, it, we just completely Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria are completely out of the picture, but the focus becomes other places. Asia, Greece, Italy, 
These are places that we're going to see in the book of Acts that up until chapter 9, uh, we've, not, we've not seen anything about. And yet Jesus said, uh, t- told his disciples uh, uh, to preach the, the gospel in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the, the earth and the uttermost parts of the world. And so we begin to see this slow transition in focus. And then it, not just in, in the people from Jews to Gentiles or in place from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world, but then in preachers. Up until now, uh, most of our focus has been on Peter, mostly, as the, the, the head of the church in Jerusalem. Peter is the one, he's the spokesperson. He's the one that's, uh, that, that stood up and spoke in the day of Pentecost. Uh, he's the one that, that uh, went into the, the, the gate beautiful, and though John was with him, Peter is mostly the one that's speaking, and not to say that we're going to take Peter out of view, we'll never talk about Peter again. No, we'll see Peter again, but he's not going to be the main focus. Who's going to be in focus from here on out for the most part? And there'll be a chapter here or there where that won't be the case. But for the most part, and that's why I say it's a slow transition, is the focus becomes Paul. Instead of uh, um, Peter and the rest of the s- disciples, the rest of the 11 disciples in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, uh, uh, preaching to the Jews, you begin to see a slow transition to Paul preaching in the uttermost parts of the world, in, in the known world, in, in Asia, in, in Greece, into Italy, uh, mostly to Gentiles. Certainly there were to, to Jews as well. And again, that's why I'm saying it's not out of uh, uh, the view, but not in focus. Although Acts chapter 9 brings us a transition, what will remain in focus at all times through the book of Acts, as well as the entire Bible, uh, it is the answer to the question posed in verse number five. While we transition and focus the people, the place, the preachers, what stays in focus? Well, rather, let me say it this way or ask it this way. Who stays in focus? The, the one who stays in focus is the answer to the question that is posed in chapter five. And he said... Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. Jesus stays in the picture. He stays not just in the picture, but in the focus throughout the entirety of the book of Acts. Not just in the book of Acts, but from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus stays in focus. So the question, this question, who art thou, Lord, was articulated by a man named Saul. But was answered by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he is the answer to the question. Tonight, I'd like to reveal the answer to this question. The title of the message is The Question. Acts 16, The Question. Who art thou, Lord? You might say, Pastor, I already know the answer. I mean, the answer is obvious, right? Jesus Christ. I mean, it says in verse number 5, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to against... uh, 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 I'm uh, hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And so... and and, uh, in Acts chapter 22, when Paul is uh, the Apostle Paul now, not Saul, but the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 22 is repeating this story. He says, I am Jesus of Nazareth. And so, uh, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Jesus answered that question. Well, what I mean to say, you say, Pastor, I've already know that answer. Well, what I mean to say is that I want to take our passage tonight and tell you about that Jesus. I'd like to tell you about him. Now, I'm not going to get all through the message. I can just tell you that right now. So let me just give you the first point, and the last two points we'll have to cover at another time. Uh, Number one, let me say this. Who is this Jesus? Or who is uh, this Lord? Who art thou, Lord? It is Jesus, first of all, the prophesier. Now, it's interesting as we look at this passage, and we talked about the persecution. Several messages ago, we talked about the persecution. Remember, they're in Jerusalem, and I kind of gave my opinion. I, I can't find a verse that specifically says, well, they were comfortable in Jerusalem, and they weren't going to leave Jerusalem until they were persecuted. We don't see a verse that says that specifically. But I, I express that I think it's my, it's my belief that I think that what happened in Jerusalem is, boy, and, and, and it's not like we can throw stones and be critical of them. You wouldn't feel any different. I mean, if, you're, if the disciples, if the church leaders could do miracles. I mean, think about a church that had no sick. We're going to mention prayer requests. In fact, there's uh, uh, people that are not able to be here tonight because of sickness. We'll start mentioning people, this person's sick and this person. Imagine being in the first church or that church there in Jerusalem 
there was never a prayer request for someone to be sick. Why? Because if they were sick, they would come to church and the disciples would heal them. The apostles would heal them. They didn't have any sickness in the church. They had no needs. You had people, you had the, the Spirit of God in a way uh, uh, that, that Brother Harris and I were talking about this the other day, that I, I, I don't know how to explain this. I wish I could get my head around this, but we don't see this in this way now. We don't see the power of the Spirit. I'm not saying I don't have the, 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 the Spirit of God, nor do you, but the filling of the Spirit of God in a way that we, we haven't, I've not seen. I mean, the, the, with the miracles and, and, and being able to speak in tongues and the power of God that fell upon them. Now look, if you went to a church like that, would you want to leave? Would you want to go somewhere else? No, you wouldn't want to go somewhere else. And so sometimes we say, well, they were comfortable in their church and they weren't being obedient. I mean, the, the, the Great Commission was to, to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other most parts of the world, world and, and they were just staying in Jerusalem. They weren't doing the rest of it. Well, I mean, you probably wouldn't do it. I probably wouldn't do any different. I mean, you talk about a, a great church. I mean, the, the leaders of the church had seen Jesus with their own eyes. They were meeting in places where Jesus had walked. Why go anywhere else other than the fact that Jesus had commanded them to? And I think they were comfortable. I think that things were, were going well. Uh, um, but as they began to preach the gospel, and, and Stephen was the one that, that he preached the gospel, and he's the one that says, hey, uh, he said to the, priest, uh, the high priest, you're the one that crucified him, which they literally are the ones that turned him over to, to, to uh, um, uh, the Romans. This was the same high priest. We're talking about uh, three months after the cr crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The same high priest, the same council. We're not talking about a different council. We're not talking about a different high priest. We're not talking about years in between, uh, you know, Matthew, or I'm sorry, John, uh, well, it would be Luke that, that, that uh, was, uh, acts as the continuation of Luke. Luke chapter 23 and Acts chapter uh, uh, six, seven, we're not talking about years, we're talking about months in between. Same high priest, same council, and Stephen says, uh, um, which one of the prophets have, uh, have your fathers not uh, persecuted? And you killed Jesus. And so they said, well, we're going to kill you too. So they took Stephen and they, they, they killed him. They, 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 they stoned him. And uh, then Saul began to persecute. And we see even more that not just in Jerusalem, but in, in, in he wanted to go to Damascus in Syria, further north. And so he wants to go to other places. because where, Why? Because they were all in Jerusalem at one point, but now after this persecution, they began to spread out everywhere. And Saul said, hey, we can't have this. We've got to go to Damascus. We've got to stop them in Damascus. We can't let them go to Damascus. And so Saul begins to, uh, uh, verse, uh, nine, verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter, he threatened to kill and murder, against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And I, I, I have not spent a lot of time studying this out, to be honest with you, but I, I don't, and, and because I'm not sure I'd have the answer, it's a lot of supposition, uh, but the, 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 the Jewish people, the, 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 the unbelieving Jews here, they didn't have the power to crucify people. Well, we know that with Jesus Christ. They, 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 had, they could try him, they could beat him, but to be killed... Stephen was taken outside the city of Jerusalem. But to be killed, to be crucified, to be official civil authority capital punishment, it had to be to the authorities of the government. That was Rome. Well, if they were going to uh, Damascus, they would have had to do something. I, I don't know what, what these letters were for, where they were to the other, other I, I believe what my belief is they was to the other uh, uh, um, uh, synagogues in Damascus. But maybe there were also letters in regard to the authorities along the way. I mean, what are the Romans thinking? And this, some guy's just bringing prisoners all tied up from Damascus down to Jerusalem. And so uh, what, what the civil uh, or red tape it was to do that, I, I don't have the answer to that. But we have here uh, uh, 
Saul breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples. Our chapter opens up that way. And when I say that as Jesus the prophesier, I think it's important to understand that this didn't come as a surprise or should not have come as a surprise to these apostles, to these disciples. And when I say Jesus the prophesier, I want to be cautious not to call Jesus a prophet. However, in that sense, he is a prophet. It's just when you call Jesus a prophet, you're... You're, you're lowering him from who he was. Isaiah was a prophet. Jeremiah was a prophet. Uh, Ezekiel was a prophet. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, John, the Baptist. We're prophets. Jesus was far more than a prophet. Now, he prophesied, and in that sense, as someone who prophesies as a prophet, but Jesus was more than a prophet. So I'm, I didn't, I'm not calling him Jesus the prophet just because I want to be careful. Uh, he's more than a prophet, but he prophesied. And tonight, just for a few minutes, I'd like to take our Bibles and uh, uh, show you how Jesus prophesied to them about this persecution. Can I ask you this? What's the purpose of a prophesier, a prophet? What's the purpose? Isaiah is a prophet. What was the purpose of him prophesying? Jeremiah is a prophet. Hosea, Zephaniah. What's the purpose of a prophet? You say, well, the, the purpose of a prophet is to prophesy, to tell things of the future. And that's not the purpose. That's the, that's the responsibility. That's the job. That's what they do. What's the purpose? What's the purpose of prophecy? The purpose of prophecy is to provide preparation, to prepare. Why, did, why was their uh, prophecy given? To prepare them for what was about to come. Why was the, the birth of Jesus Christ prophesied? To prepare Israel for Jesus. We don't have time to get into this. We were talking in our family devotions this morning about John the Baptist. And you say, uh, well, John the Baptist, he was preaching something different. No, he was preaching repent. Yeah, that's something different. No, that's not. What they were doing is they were not serving God. They were not obeying God. They were not looking to God. They were not looking for the Messiah. And he's saying, no, repent. Come to God. Look for the Messiah. That's what repent is. Turn from your ways uh, and your beliefs. Turn from uh, ignoring God. You say, well, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were worshiping God, not according to John the Baptist. He said, repent. They came to get baptized. Baptism is a picture of dying to the old man and a, a rising, a, a, a resurrection to new life. That's a picture of repentance. It's a picture of saying, all right, this is done. I'm done with my old life. I'm done with my sin. I'm done with my false beliefs. I'm turning to God and accepting Christ. John the Baptist was preaching that, and then he was baptizing them as a sign that they were believing in God. This isn't in the notes. I don't know how I'm getting this far down the road on a rabbit trail. But the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees came to John the Baptist and they said, we want to get baptized too. And he said, show me fruit of repentance. Meat for repentance. Show me that you really believe in God. You're believing in a false sense of religion. You're not believing in God. You're not looking for the Messiah. And so... Uh, um, uh, this prophecy that was given, the prophecy for Jesus Christ, was to prepare them to be looking for Jesus Christ. There were at least two or more, as the song says three, wise men in the east that were looking for him. They were prepared. We don't know how many wise men, how many kings there were. I mean, the song says we three kings of Orient. I don't know how many there were. And we know they had uh, three gifts. But those guys were looking. They were prepared. Many were not prepared. Jesus, in his prophecy, was preparing them for what was going to happen. You say, Pastor, how was he preparing them? Let's look through the book of Matthew. Now, we could look in the book of Mark, the book of Luke, the book, the book of John, but we're just going to look at three passages tonight, solely in the book of Matthew, that Jesus, in his prophecy, prepared his disciples, prepared his apostles for this very day. Let's look what it says, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Who's he speaking to, Matthew chapter 5? Think, 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 Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. 
Who does he start off with? Matthew chapter 5. The, he starts with the... Who, well, he starts with the Beatitudes. Who does he start with? The disciples, right? And before long, he's got great multitudes. He's on, the, uh, he's on the mount. He's preaching a sermon on the mount. That'd be a good title for that sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. This time right now, in the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, he's preaching what we'd call the Beatitudes. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Now, how many prophets, you think, say, you know what, you're going to be blessed if you're persecuted? I wonder how many prophets... Most prophets, especially prophets or prophets, when I say prophets, you know, not real prophets. Um, hey, if you obey me, you follow me, you'll be, you'll be blessed. If you follow me, you'll be rich. You'll, you'll receive many blessings. You'll have everything you need. That Jesus prepared them. Now he blessed them and he provided a blessing, but he prepared them. Look what it says, Matthew chapter 5. We look at these... these um, these beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are they which are persecuted for, wait a minute, uh, merciful, p- pure in heart, peacemakers, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, blessed are you when men shall, verse 11, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Here on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus provides, through his prophecy, he provides motivation. He says, hey, when you are persecuted, you'll be blessed. God, I'll take care of you. You're laying up rewards in heaven. Now here comes the Messiah. They were not ready for this. What did they think the Messiah was going to do? We remember, back at the beginning of Acts, remember we said the transition, the very first message in the book of Acts, the transition. What did, even the apostles, the disciples, what did, what did they think was going to happen? They, they thought the Messiah was going to come and set up his kingdom. They hadn't, they hadn't studied Isaiah 53 very well. They thought the Messiah was going to come and set up a kingdom, and they were looking, all right, Jesus, when are you going to set up your kingdom? And Jesus, in one of his very first messages, said, listen, guys, I'm going to provide a blessing for you. And one of those blessings is when you're persecuted. Well, what are you talking about? You're the king. Well, we're not going to be persecuted. You're, the one, you're going to be the one that's taking care of us. You're going to be the one that we're going to follow you. We're not going to be. And I think even Peter, when they were ready to go to the garden, Peter's thinking, I'm not going to deny you. I'm going to follow you. You're going to be the king. You're not going to be crucified. I think that was Peter's motivation to some degree. And they were in, of the mindset that, that there was never a need for persecution. We're following the Messiah. We're following the King of Kings. They were. But they were also following the sacrifice. And so he provides motivation for them. He says, hey, you're going to be blessed. I'll bless you. Not with riches here. Not with blessings here. But with uh, uh, rewards in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. So when they persecute you, let me tell you, I'm going to bless you. He provided, it through prophecy, he, he prophesied uh, of persecution. Through prophesy, he, a prophecy, he provided motivation. Is that the only time he talked about persecution? Absolutely not. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Uh, skip over a few pages. Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, he's talking to his disciples. In fact, he's sending them out. He says in verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now, wait a minute. This is the Messiah. I want to be a wolf among sheep. I don't want to be a sheep among wolves. That kind of sounds dangerous. How many say being a sheep among wolves is kind of dangerous? Yeah, one sheep in the flock sounds dangerous, right? How about one sheep in a pack? Does that sound even more dangerous? Absolutely, but that's what he says here. One sheep among the pack. Look what it says. Behold, I send you forth as a sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. Wait a minute. What happened to Stephen? What happened to Peter and John? Remember when they went in and that they healed the... Who did they go before? The council. 
Jesus is prophesying of this very day that we're reading in the book of Acts. What was the letters that, the, that, that Saul was taking to Damascus? To take people bound to Jerusalem. To what? To the council. Jesus is prophesying of this very thing. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. We read about that the other day and on Wednesday night. Remember? They were threatening, and then they said, well, we'll just beat them and send them home and threaten them and say, don't speak in his name. This happened in the book of Acts. Jesus prophesied about it. He was preparing them. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour that ye shall speak. How will we know? You'll have the Holy Ghost that came and gave them languages that they didn't even know. Not languages that are not known, but they didn't know. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father, the child, and the ch children shall rise up against the parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in which city? This city. Talking about Jerusalem. Flee ye into another. He's giving them instruction. Not only did he provide motivation, but he provided instruction. When they persecute you, this is what I want you to do. But when they persecute you in this city, flee into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the city of Israel, uh, over the cities of Israel, till the Son of Man be come. And so he said, all right, this is what I want you to do. You're going to be persecuted. They're going to deliver you to councils. Don't think about what to say. The Spirit of the Father is going to come, and he's going to tell you what to say. And when they persecute you in this city, in Jerusalem, go to another city. And that's exactly what they did. Jesus provided instruction. He provided motivation, and then he provided instruction. One other place, and uh, one other prophecy, Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. I'm still on the first point. I, I, I'm looking at the clock, and I'm glad that we're going to dial it down right now after this, this thought here. Matthew chapter 23 is an interesting chapter to me. I've thought about preaching on this chapter uh, several times, and I, I'm not quite ready to preach on this whole chapter here, but this is the, and I think I've mentioned it before, I, this is the woe chapter. Woe to the Pharisees. Woe, 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 woe. Verse 13, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Verse 14, woe. Verse 15, woe. Verse 16, woe. Verse 23, woe. Verse 25, woe. Verse 27, woe. Verse 29, woe. Woe. He's saying to the Pharisees, to the scribes and the Pharisees. Look at verse number 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. Who's he talking to? Scribes and Pharisees, right? I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye, and he's not talking to the disciples, he's talking to the, the, the scribes and Pharisees. Ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues. Check. It's already happened in the book of Acts, I mean, from what we've read. And persecute them from city to city. It's happening right now. Acts chapter 9, verse number 1. Jesus, through prophecy, is preparing... His people. He's prepared motivation. He's pre prepared uh, uh, instruction. And now he's preparing condemnation. Look what it says in the next verse. That upon you. Who's the you? Who's the you? Scribes and Pharisees. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. And so he's providing condemnation. Say, Pastor, what's the point today or tonight? It's just one thought in regard to Jesus, the prophesier. And we get to Acts chapter 9, and we see it very, uh, very clearly uh, that if we go back to just the book of Matthew, we can see that Jesus 
prepared them. Through the word of God, through prophecy, he said, hey, you're going to be prophesied. He gave them motivation. He gave them instruction. He even provided condemnation, not to them, but to those who were uh, uh, persecuting them. Pastor, what's the point? Because we have the word of God. We have prophecy. It's here to provide motivation. It's here to provide instruction. Say, Pastor, what should I do? I, I, let me get, I was telling the, the Hazers a, a point, the third sub point of the third point in the message uh, 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 that I'm not going to be able to get to uh, tonight. But let me just say it real quick. Um, Ananias, the Lord comes to Ananias and he, they, he says, Ananias, I want you to, there's a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. I want you to go and I want you to take care of him. And Ananias goes, uh, Lord, I think I've heard about this guy. And I haven't heard very many good things. They're all kind of bad. And, and the Lord tells Ananias to do something that doesn't necessarily make sense to him. But he's able to trust the Lord. And why is that? Because the Lord, and we'll talk about that name and that that word uh, uh, the next time we preach on this passage, is trustworthy. Is trustworthy. Look, we're not to put our trust in man. man. We're to put our trust in the Lord. We're to put our trust... In this book, what he's told us. Um, uh, Jacob is, uh, um, just for, uh, for sake of illustration, Jacob is a, is a CPA. And uh, he works for an investing firm. And I, I have money and to invest. And so I come to Jacob and I say, Jacob, what do I do with my money? And Jacob says... Uh, put it in the, what is it, the, the, the uh, NF, uh, the, what's that, the FTX? Is that what's under the, the FTX? The MLB FTX. I don't know a lot about it, but I've seen the, the headlines. And I say, okay, I'm going to put uh, my millions of dollars, not really, but my millions of dollars into the FTX, the MLB FTX. And what happened? I think there's, what, there's $11 billion <laughs> lawsuit or something. And so I put my trust in, in Jacob. The next time I have millions of dollars to invest, do you think I'm going to Jacob? No. <laughs> no, I'm not going to Jacob. I'm going to go somewhere else. And, and we can use that illustration in a multiplicity of ways. Go to a doctor. The doctor gives you bad counsel. You're not going to go back to that doctor again. You know, whatever, all the different things. But can I tell you that Jesus is trustworthy. When we go to the word of God, you say, I don't know, I don't know that I, I, my experience tells me otherwise. And I'm telling you the word of God, the Lord is trustworthy. I can trust him. I can trust him for my salvation. I can trust him for my peace, my confidence. Does it mean that everything's going to work out the way that I want it to do? Not necessarily, but it'll work out to his glory. But what we start doing is we start saying, well, it, 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 it's not the way that I want it to be. So I'm not going to trust in, in the Lord. I'll trust somewhere else. And I'm here to tell you that the Lord is trustworthy. He's just. He's just. And it may not always, we may not always be able to see it on this side of eternity, but when we get to the other side, we'll be able to see it and we'll say, oh, he was just. He was always just. And because of that, he's trustworthy. What I'm saying tonight is this. We have a motivation. We have instruction. We even have the word of condemnation in this book. It's all been prophesied. It's all been given to us. What I'm saying tonight is you can trust it. Jesus, before he left, said, Persecute, guys, persecution's coming. We turn over a few pages, book of Acts. Look at that. Persecution. I mean, almost literally to the letter as he explains it. 
being scourged and beaten in the synagogues. Can you imagine the disciples hearing that? When they, when they scourge you in the synagogues and the disciples, I, I can't imagine what that's like. Come on, Jesus. I mean, really? Uh, when, they, when they take me to the synagogues? And yet we turn over Acts chapter 9. Yep, letters to the synagogues in Damascus to come and bind them, bring them down to Jerusalem, to the council. Exactly what Jesus said. I'm here to tell you, you can trust him. His word is true. And we just need to trust him. Father in heaven, Lord, I, I thank you for your instruction. I'm thankful for your motivation. I'm thankful for the, even the condemnation I see in scripture. And help us, Lord, I pray, trust in you. Trust in your word. Lord, as you told your disciples, your apostles, what you said came true. And your prophecy prepared them your word, if we would be in it. I don't know what it was like. I, I know that there were some disciples that left you, Lord left your son. But I wonder if there were some that were absent in some of these lessons. And they didn't make it during persecution because they were not there to hear it. And help us, Lord, I pray, to be attentive to the word of God. That we can trust you, Lord, we pray. We ask you, bless uh, during the prayer time tonight, that you'd be honored and glorified. and Help us, Lord, I pray, to trust in you in every matter, in every way. We pray in Jesus Christ's name for his sake. Amen.